Now let's look at briefly at a couple of central investigations which are going to help you or aid you in your decision making. Now, the first thing is the electrocardiogram. Now, this invention is more than 100 years old, but it is still the most relevant and central investigation as far as a acute chest pain is concerned. Now, the important thing is whenever you suspect an ACS, you should do an ECG as promptly as you can. International guidelines suggest that it should be typically obtained within 10 minutes of your first seeing the patient. And we'll discuss why this is very important. In fact, in many of the uh, developed nations coming up, so a person who's kind of, uh, you know, picked up the chest pain at the peripheral level, the onus is now shifting to doing an ECG in the ambulance itself and then transmitting it to the hospital so that there is no time lost. It can be reviewed by a professional and then a diagnosis can be made as to whether this indicates an acute coronary syndrome or not. And even to initiate therapy such as thrombolysis, even before the patient comes to the hospital. So this is the uh, importance given to the rapidity with which an ECG needs to be performed whenever you suspect an acute coronary syndrome. Now I'll just want to put a important caveat here that a single normal ECG does not necessarily exclude an ACS. And we will again come back to this uh, point in a short while. So what do you look for in an ECG? Okay, well, you got an ECG promptly. The question is, what are the important pointers which you can look for? Again, we're not going to go into the details of everything which an ECG can potentially show. I just want to emphasize a couple of important points. The main issue as far as an acute coronary syndrome or an MI is concerned is going to be looking at changes in the STT segment, okay? So either ST depression or ST elevation or T wave inversion. So I just want you to keep for now these three points in your mind, which are high yield features on the ECG. So you're all aware of the ST segment, the segment from where the QRS ends to where the T wave begins. And you can see here, pointed out in lead two, an example of ST segment elevation. The ST segment is pushed up above the baseline. You can see on the right side in lead V5, the corresponding ST depression, where your ST segment is pushed below the baseline. And then below in lead V3 on the rhythm strip, you can see we have pointed out the T wave inversion, which is accompanying the ST depression. Now, sometimes you may have an ECG like this, where you have all of these findings coming together, or you may have one or the other in isolation. And these are some of the important things which you can look for in an acute ECG setting. Now, we talked about the issue that a single normal ECG may not exclude ACS. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One which is very important is that, especially very early in the course of an MI, the ECG can be completely normal, or it may not show these classical changes and show some of the less often seen features, such as hyperacute T waves. So that is something to keep in mind. Secondly, why we should do serial assessment rather than just stick with one ECG is that sometimes changes can be dynamic. So remember, sometimes a coronary artery may be going into spasm or it may be getting transiently occluded, may be getting opened up again transiently. There can be kind of a stuttering kind of progression in some of these cases. And so when you look at the ECG, you may find one ECG showing an ST depression, but subsequently another ECG looking completely normal. And these kind of dynamic changes are very useful to know that this ECG is kind of more in favor of an ongoing acute coronary syndrome. So this is the central importance as far as an ECG is concerned. The only other investigation I'll talk about, because these are the two investigations which are mainly involved in decision making, are the cardiac biomarkers. So what are these biomarkers? They are basically nothing but certain proteins which leak out into the blood from the injured heart or from the injured myocardial. So they are basically markers of myocardial injury.
So there are two main ones which are often used in clinical practice. The cardiac troponins, troponin I and troponin T, which are much more specific to the injured myocardium and therefore they are largely used now in most practices. The other more classical biomarker is the CKMB, which is less often used now because it is less specific. But since it's so widely and easily available, it is still relevant, especially in some of the peripheral areas where high specific troponins may or may not be available. Again, just like we said for the ECG, one should think in terms of looking at serial biomarker assessments, especially if the clinical suspicion is on the higher side.